This video is about the story of a remarkable letter. A letter between two kings. A letter sent from King Robert the Bruce to King Edward II of England on one of his campaigns into Scotland. Edward camped here with his army. A messenger would appear with a letter from Robert the Bruce who was a mere thirty odd miles away. That letter would give us an insight into how one king would communicate with another invading king. This is Boghall Castle, probably one of the lesser known castles and certainly not one that is mentioned too often when we talk about the medieval period, the Scottish Wars of Independence and the time of Robert the Bruce. But it's also an extremely significant place. Scant ruins of a later period are all that remain here, three parts to the castle. Boghall Castle, as the name suggests, was surrounded by bog and marsh. It was, was not an easy castle to access. But the importance of it today, the importance stretches back to the year 1310, when King Edward II of England camped here with his army all around and King Edward II stayed in Boghall Castle. Something remarkable would happen here. Edward II made his way from Roxburgh up to this place, just outside the town of Bigger. Now Robert the Bruce had his scouts out, tracking the English army. Bruce was a short distance away, 35 miles in Kildarn, what is modern day Cumbernauld. Well, Edward stayed here. And while his army were camped out in these very grounds, this was an imposing castle uh, at its time, with a significant moat. But what happened here? Someone arrived from the Bruce contingent with a letter for King Edward II. A letter that was found in recent times 
in the correspondences of Edward III. The letter is dated October 1310, just as winter setting in and just as the English campaign is about to end. That letter would prove to be a remarkable insight into the communications between two men. Bruce, in this letter, spoke as king to king. He recognised King Edward II's kingship, but he wrote in such a way that he was a king in the fullest sense of the word. That amazing letter is written as such. To the most serene prince, the Lord Edward, by God's grace, illustrious King of England, Robert, by the same grace, King of Scots, greeting in him through which the thrones of those who rule are governed, when, under the sweetness of peace, the minds of the faithful find rest. Then the life of Christians is adorned with good conduct. And also the whole of Holy Mother Church. Because the affair of all kingdoms are everywhere arranged more favourably. Our humility has led us now and at other times to beseech your highness most earnestly so that having God and public decency in sight, you would take pains to cease from the persecution of us and the disturbance of the people of our kingdom, in order that devastation and the spilling of Christian blood may henceforth stop. Naturally, everything which we and our people will be able to do by bodily service or to bear by giving freely of our goods for the redemption of good peace and for the grace of your goodwill for all time which must be earned. We are prepared and shall be prepared to accomplish in a suitable and honest way with a pure heart and if accords with your will to have a discussion with us on these matters May your royal eminence send word in writing to us by the bearer of this letter. Written at Kildrum in Lennox, the calends of October in the fifth year of her reign. So Robert the Bruce has declared in no uncertain terms his status as King of Scots. Edward would not respond to this letter, but they would arrange to meet later on at Selkirk. Those negotiations fell apart. Further negotiations, follow-ups would be made to meet Robert the Bruce at Melrose, but Bruce was a no-show, sensing a trap.
Robert Bruce may well have been playing for time when, when he penned that letter. After all, it was October, and usually the time that English campaigns would retreat with their armies. What's remarkable is the wording of the letter and how Bruce projected his status of kingship into the English king. It was said that Robert the Bruce feared the dead bones of Edward I more than he feared the living body of Edward II. And there can be some substance to that. Edward I was especially fond of Robert the Bruce when he was in the English court. Perhaps he saw a little bit of himself in the young Robert the Bruce. He flew into a rage in 1306 when Bruce had made his bid for the throne. But he passed shortly after. When Edward II came north here with his army, perhaps it was to draw Robert the Bruce out into the open. But up until that time, that was not Robert's game. That's not how he played matters. But the wording of that letter reveals Bruce's living ambition to be King of Scots, to have an independent kingdom from England and leaving no doubt as to what he would do to accomplish that. I would love to have been a fly on the wall when Edward II stayed here at Boghall Castle. When Bruce's messenger arrived, Edward II read the letter, knowing that Robert the Bruce was a day's ride away. What his thoughts were, with his whole army camped around here, with winter setting in, was Bruce playing for time? Was Edward trying to lure him out into the open? Edward's next move would be to head back south. Edward returned to Berwick and would not venture into Scotland until four years later, where he would experience a heavy loss at the Battle of Bannockburn.